Welcome back. I'm visiting here today with Robin Lee. Robin is a venture capitalist here in Silicon Valley. Welcome to today's show. Thank you for having me. So, Robin, for the listeners here, um, I'd like you to give the background of how you moved into venture capital. Let's start with, um, you know, where'd you grow up, go to school, and and uh, eventually uh, land where you are today. Sure. So, I was born in Hong Kong, and so I immigrated with my parents and my family when I was about five years old to New York City area, and then eventually moved and grew up my childhood in New Jersey. I went to a state school there for undergrad, which was Rutgers University, where I studied econ and art history. Um, after, you know, a few years um, after college was where I spent was Teach for America, and I taught special education in the projects in Brooklyn, in New York. Wow, that's that's quite a, a you know a career path. But you went then from the projects in Teach America into venture capital. Yeah. How did, I, that, how did that happen? That's really... Uh... After Teach for America, I actually went to business school. So I went to University of Chicago. I went to business school there. And so okay. I spent two years in Chicago. And I really didn't know um, much about venture capital when I first moved there. And it was a lot of... I actually volunteered in the city quite a bit. And I volunteered in some accelerators was when I got um, my exposure first into startups and entrepreneurship. Um, and so it was, you know... I've always grown up in a sense of giving back just because, because I was so lucky to be in the U.S. And so teaching was my way of doing that. And when I moved to Chicago, it was working with the community there and working with the entrepreneurs. And that was when I learned about venture. And um, it was during school where I got involved with venture capital and have been in since. So right out of college, you started with a venture firm? No, right out of college, I went to Teach for America. But uh, your master's degree? My master's degree was when I was teaching, and so I got a master's degree in education and special education. Okay. Um, after three years of teaching and my last year being an administrator, I ended up going back to business school. Um, so out of business school, then it was immediately into venture capital? That's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, you're currently with a vice president with GGV. Uh, did you start with GGV right out of school or...? During business school, I actually interned um, at a venture capital firm in China, in Beijing, oh. called Qiming Venture Partners. Mm-hmm. Um, that was actually um, a very fortunate and, and lucky part of my life because I've actually, I've lived in a lot of different places. I've you know lived in Hong Kong, I've lived in the US, I've lived in Peru, I've lived in Italy and Spain, but I've actually never been to mainland China until I was in business school. And it was that opportunity where I was like, hey, I haven't been to China, but I, I'm Chinese, right? Like how different could it be? And so I took the chance and went there and it was a bit of a culture shock actually, because um, even though I, w- I was from Hong Kong myself, um, China has grown so much and it's become so different and so fast moving um, that I was there where I got excited about what was happening and in the cities in China and how big and how of an opportunity it was. and so. That's why I ended up being um, started off in that venture firm in in Beijing that summer. How, how did you find? Now I've I've been to China, uh, not lived there, but I, you know, is there for uh, you know enough to get familiar with uh, the business community? How did you find the business doing business in China versus in the U.S.? Was it was there a big difference in culture? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think. The there's a lot of nuances that are different in terms of like the hours that people work in China or, or um, I think one of the reasons why I chose working with GGV was the fact that I could work in both US and China cross border while um, I'm very excited about uh, working in China and working on a China fund um, without being a local resident there it's very difficult to like build out your own network just like in the valley itself, right? Like it's really hard to invest in Silicon Valley if you're based out of a different country. And so um, I do think that there are, there are definitely some differences in terms of um, how people live their everyday lives, what they consume, right? And how they communicate is very different. Like in the US, we communicate a lot over email, over a lot text messages, but in China, everything is done on WeChat, for example, not email first. So give me some background on GGV uh, as, a, as a, a, a venture capital firm. How big are they? How did you 
first come to know them? Yeah, so um, I first came to know about GGV through Hans Tung. He was actually a partner where I had interned in China that summer, and he um, he relocated to the U.S. and actually joined GGV as one of the managing partners. And so during business school was when I, um, during my second internship was when I worked at GGV Capital from Chicago. And so GGV is a venture firm that's been around for about 20 years. In the very beginning, we've always um, believed that both U.S. and China are very important tech economies and and will continue to be in the future. And so our founders had open offices in Shanghai and in Menlo Park, and we now have um, Beijing as well. And so we manage about $4 billion over eight funds, and we are a multi-stage fund. And so we invest in many different stages, life stages of a, of a company, um, whether it's from just ideation or even to up to pre-IPO. And so we'll support founders like the whole way through. We invest in like three core areas, one being consumer internet, two being enterprise software as a service, and then three being frontier tech, IoT, that's more AI robotics. And so I myself um, cover consumer internet and that encompasses like e-commerce, social, digital media, and travel. I'm visiting here today for Robin Lee. She is a vice president with GTV Capital. And um, Robin, I need to take a quick break. And we'll be right back after these messages. Grandpa, can we do chemistry? Papa, Daddy. Grandpa, let's do some kid fun. We'll help you stay organized so you can focus on what really matters in life. Give us a call today and see how we can help you start saving taxes. <laughs> <laughs> the first segment we talked about, you know, how you started your career in teaching and then went back, got a business degree, master's degree, University of Chicago, and then moved into the venture capital uh, area. Uh, went to China for a period of time and then joined with uh, one of the, the, the partners who was uh, relocating into the U.S. And when you're working on a day-to-day basis on venture capital, what's it like? being that venture capitalist? Yeah, I think um, venture capital is a very exciting and very rewarding career. And um, Just to give a sense of kind of what we do, I'm on the investment team at GGV. And so a lot of my time is spent on one, crafting kind of what area should we invest in? What is our investment thesis this year? That changes throughout the year as we learn more, like should we invest in you know, offline retail, experiential retail, right? Or should we invest in health and wellness? And so these are areas that like I would research. And upon researching, it would be a lot of talking to founders, talking to experts, what's happening in this space and should we invest, right? And so a good chunk of my time is really spent on talking to founders and meeting founders. Um, And then another part would be diligencing a company. And so whenever we make an investment, we actually have to um, dive deep into that company. We um, learn a lot about the founders, a lot about the management team, a lot about their vision. But we also have to figure out, hey, is this an area that has a big opportunity? Is the market large enough? And so do the numbers make sense? Um, and that depends on what the life stage of the company is, of course, and it differs along the way. But um, yeah, a lot of my time is also spending on should we do this deal as GGV? How much should we invest in the company? Um, and then lastly, we do a lot of portfolio management as well. And so once a company um, takes investment from us, it becomes uh, a part of the GGV family. And so we help support the company in many ways. Typically, we um, take a board seat or an observer seat on the board for a company. And so we make uh, we help the founders with a lot of strategic direction, um, a lot of hiring for the executive team as well, and, and think through a lot of the problems. But but really, like we don't we can't take credit for <laughs> how great a company becomes. We're really much of an advisor along the way and a sounding board. So when um, when you're working with companies, obviously there's a period of time where you want to get to know them and the due diligence. And how long does that usually last? How long would you like to watch a company? 
It really depends. Um, we like to build a relationship with the founder as long as possible because it's really hard to. Sometimes it happens where it's rapid fire, right? Where you meet a company, they're already in the middle of a fundraise, and they're like trying to close within the next week, and you're like, I have to do all my work by then, and and try to meet them and meet the team and do all this research, um, do surveys or something. But you know, the, but it's really hard to assess a person, right? Just to, after meeting them for a few hours. And so a lot of the companies that we end up investing in, we know for a long period of time. Sometimes it begins on, um, I would approach a founder, they would approach me, and um, we help them out, right? Um, we may not invest yet, but um, there are a lot of deals that we've done where we built a year long of relationship with a founder or more. That number again, it, it's six six billion under management, or it's four billion. Four, four billion. Okay, there's six funds, but with China, there's eight funds. Okay, so I'm trying to get my my numbers straight, but that's that's quite the size of fund. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and what the average size is around one point two billion in. Uh, that's the fund. The our current fund the size. Current fund size. Okay, so yeah, first of all. Uh, you know, when when a fund is established, it's a certain time frame from start to end when these things need to wrap up. I think it'll be around for what ten years or what? Yeah, most of our funds are a ten year cycle, and so we typically work with founders for a long period of time. Okay, so I, I want to walk through. Um, we we started to delve into types of investments that you would go into, but. Um, it's quite a process. You said in the last segment that sometimes you'll observe for like a year. But let's say you start in working with a company. Will you often take a board seat or not always? But Typically, if we write a large, larger check and we have um, more ownership in a company, we would definitely take a board seat. It's pretty important to be there as a board member because we get to um, work very closely with the founders and work very closely with the company. Now, how do you, you know, the, I'm sure you get a lot of people coming to you saying, we need money, we need money, we need money. But how, what's the deciding factor of who you work with versus who you don't? Um, one, it has to kind of fit within the purview of our fund, right? And so we don't invest in just any category. We have three core categories that we invest in. And so if a biotech company comes to us, we probably can't do that type of deal, for example. Um, but... Uh, you know, what we look for in companies is really the founding team and the founder vision and what, um, you know, they want to do. And typically, if a, a company asks us for money, we really have to get to know them and get to understand, like, why do they need this money and why specifically venture, right? Because not all companies actually should be venture capital funded. You know, when, um, when you begin working with a company and in Today's landscape it, it, the, the, with technology, everything's changing so fast. Do you find oftentimes these companies will start on one platform and then the market has shifted so they need to redo their visions and their, their platform? And how does that work? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the market changes over time. Product changes a lot over time as well. And so I could give an example. Um, one of our portfolio companies is Slack. Um, which in the very beginning, it was just, uh, it was more of a gaming company and a different type of what product than what it is today. Slack today is a messaging company that allows people within a workforce or w within family and friends to communicate with one another over um, a desktop version or a web app um, or a mobile app as well. And so when it first started, it was really a, a gaming um, producer, but it really pivoted because they found that they needed to figure out a way to chat internally with each other and thus created an internal Slack and saw that really take off and then decided to open it up and pivot the company into this larger opportunity they found um, that got a lot more product market fit. And today they have millions of users. What do you see with current trends in the market today for the markets you serve? What, what's happening in the e-commerce and yeah, I mean, everyone is always talking about retail is dying, what is happening. But what, what we see is actually um, e-commerce globally is still only 23% penetration of all um, retail spend, right? And that means for every dollar that's spent, only 23 cents is really um, going to e-commerce. And so there's still a massive opportunity of um, where e-commerce can grow, even in the U.S., 
last year was still in the low teens in terms of penetration. And so um, we definitely see a lot more of people, you know, now using mobile phones to do purchases instead of just desktop. Before e-commerce used to be just buying on your computer, right now it has really transitioned to like instantly in your pocket. And that affects a lot of different things, whether it's um, categories that get um, more e-commerce penetration. So books, for example, a lot easier for you to just buy online. But like, how about makeup and clothes um, and, and everyday items that you may need to touch and feel first? And so there's still a lot of challenges that need to be solved around like consumer experience, the right platform. We also look at a lot of adjacent categories to e-commerce, such as payments or logistics as well. Is it a good thing to see Amazon continuing to get bigger and dominate the markets even more? I don't think that like Amazon is going to take the entire pie, right? Um, even today, they're still around maybe 40% of the e-commerce spend. And I think that they're really healthy for the economy as well, right? Because they're pushing for innovation. They get customers um, better used to what e-commerce is like. And um, they might own a big chunk of the market, but there's definitely a lot more room for long tail or other categories that are not yet proliferating on Amazon. So if a person wants to go and, and contact you, how would, they, how would they do that? Say they got a great technology, a great company. Robin, you got to see this. Just reach out to us, right? We're very accessible. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on our website as with most of, you know, everyone on our team is there as well. Come to our conferences. I host conferences um, in New York, in the Bay Area, and I host a series of dinners and events. And so we're, we're pretty much out there all the time. Don't be afraid. I think a lot of times founders hesitate to cold email. Like I actually cold email, cold email founders myself, right? <laughs> so like as a founder, you should never hesitate. What's, what's the worst that could happen? So for listeners, why don't you give us your email address? It's rli at ggvc.com. And so uh, a final note here. In, in, in context of where do you see this market heading in, say, five years into the future? I think that um, e-commerce will continue to grow bigger and, and people find it easier to just like buy on their phones. But I do think that um, the market will change much more on the offline retail side than just the online, right? I think people will just do one click button buy or replenishment in their home, whether it be over voice, whether it be over the phone, right? Um, it, that doesn't really matter. But I do think that um, how people spend their time offline instead of going to the department stores that may not be there anymore, right? As, as we know, um, people will look for more unique experiences and look for experiential retail and, and places they can go with their friends um, and, and hang out together, but also um, consume at the same time. I've been visiting here today with Robin Lee. She's the vice president with GGV Capital. Robin, thanks for being on today's show. Thank you.